Welcome to Redefining Medicine, an intimate and personalized program that illustrates a different side of the practice of medicine. Our in-depth conversations will focus on the physicians and practitioners who are redefining medicine through their integrative, functional, and holistic approach to health and well-being. We are pleased to welcome Dr. Robert Roundtree, a board-certified family practitioner based in Boulder, Colorado, practicing a unique combination of traditional family medicine, nutrition, and herbology. Dr. Roundtree will be one of the presenters at A4M's upcoming virtual conference in August. Welcome, Dr. Roundtree. Can you please tell us a little bit more about your practice in Boulder? Well, my first interest was in herbology. That came when I was around 19. I uh, was given a book on herbal medicine called Herbs, the Magic Healers by Paul Twitchell. And I thought, well, how fascinating is that? Um, and I, I particularly like the fact that it uh, talked about different body types uh, and how different body types would respond better to certain kinds of diets and maybe different herbs would work better for different people. Now, I, I grew up in the Deep South eating uh, I don't know any other way to put it, but to say crap for food, you know. Uh, so I was not uh, skilled or educated in the whole idea of nutrition or that what you eat made a difference. And so at age 19, I got introduced to that. And I thought, well, that's pretty darn interesting. I want to find out about that. Um, my main interest was then in biology. Um, and... Uh, my desire to go to medical school kind of evolved out of that. So, you know, from the very beginning, I was interested in, you know, what I, I, I didn't realize at the time was called alternative medicine. Uh, we didn't have the term integrative medicine or anything like that. Um, you know, so it was always considered to be something on the fringe. Um, you know, but in my first few years of practice, I decided I wanted to use uh, herbs to support immune function or uh, cardiovascular health, things like that. And uh, it kind of evolved from there. The, and what I mean by it evolved is the science emerged. There wasn't a lot right. of science. It was all folk medicine, right? It, you know, it was stuff that people kind of discovered on their own and you know, things that healers had used throughout the centuries, indigenous medicine, you know, so we had to rely on that. If you went to a health food store, there would just be these big open bins of herbs. Um, you know, the, the whole idea of using standardized extracts or highly potent extracts, extracts that was not around at the time. Uh, if I wanted to give somebody milk thistle to support their liver, uh, I would sell them a big bag of seeds. You know, I have a kilogram of, of milk thistle in my office and I'd have them grind it up uh, and eat a tablespoon every day. So, uh, you know, those were, those were the days. <laughs> so, so where do you get your uh, supply of herbs uh, these days or, or is it mostly uh, extract form? Yeah, I mean, I use a wide range of companies depending on the specific uh, product that I want. Um, I mean, do you want me to mention brands or do you, you know, sure. I, I mean, I can, I, you know, I've consulted for a number of, of uh, nutraceutical companies and botanical companies over the years. And early on, I got involved with a, a company out of uh, uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming called Wyoming Wildcrafters. And, you know, the, the woman and, and the head of that would go out and collect herbs on a seasonal basis and then do extracts. So I started out using uh, tinctures that were more potent than just the raw seeds or the, or the leaves. Um, and then, you know, that, that kind of got me uh, more involved in, in how these companies work and how they think. And I got to know a, a lot of herbalists over the years. I got involved with a group called the American Herbalist Guild, um, started going to their meetings and, you know, and meeting people that had different companies and their different ideas. And then I started using some of the German uh, products, which are much higher potency extracts. 
Um, and from them, I got introduced to companies like Thorne and Metagenics, uh, you know, that, that have continued to be around to these days. And I've, uh, I've consulted with, with most of those companies over the years. More recently, uh, I've been consulting pretty closely with Thorne, uh, helping them design products and put together clinical protocols and things like that. So, so Thorne is really one of my favorite companies just because they have such super high standards. Do you um, uh, utilize CBD in your practice as well? Absolutely. Yeah, I do. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's obviously been around for a long time. Um, you know, Colorado was really one of the first states to legalize, uh, medical marijuana. And, uh, you know, I, I voted for it. Although I, I have to say when I, when that vote came, I didn't exactly know what I was voting for. You know, I, I thought basically they're just going to stop prosecuting people unnecessarily. And then the next day, everybody is, you know, out waving flags and throwing confetti. And I thought, oh, this is bigger than I had realized. Um, you know, it, it, what it meant for me as a practitioner is that I really need to get educated uh, on the science and what the uses were of, uh, you know, all the different uh, extracts of cannabis, you know, the whole range of phytocannabinoids. So that's, I, I don't think so much in, you know, in terms of CBD or THC, I think in terms of the, the whole entourage of cannabinoids. What do you find it useful for in your patient population? Um, well, especially people who can't sleep, have chronic stress, anxiety, uh, inflammatory disorders. IBS, I think, is particularly responsive to hemp oil, uh, you know, which contains CBD and other phytocannabinoids in it. So I use a lot of hemp oil. Um, uh, again, I like the combination. You know, it, it fits in for my background of herbology more than using an isolated compound like CBD or THC. What were you traditionally trained in? So I went to a family medicine residency in Hershey, Pennsylvania, and, uh, you know, it was a standard fare. It was a good program, you know, but you learn how to deal with acute problems. Uh, I must say, I, I kind of went into medicine thinking, well, I just needed this degree so that I can practice what I want, which is herbology. And then I was surprised to find that there was a lot about the scientific method that I really liked. You know, I like the idea of being discriminatory, of saying, well, okay, here's a, a, an herb that's been around for a long time. Does it really work? And, and what kind of dose do you really need? So does milk thistle really help for liver conditions? And, you know, by the way, are there other things that it might work for? Well, having been trained in the scientific method allowed me uh, a better understanding, you know, of, of how to conduct good research uh, and how to get involved in that. And so somewhere along the line, I, uh, I started uh, developing an expertise in reading medical papers and then got some gigs as a medical editor. Uh, and, you know, so I started working for, uh, for Marianne Lambert, who's actually one of the largest tr publishers of traditional medical literature out there. You know, she has many, many journals uh, in her organization, but she also has a journal called Alternative and Complementary Therapies. Uh, I became their medical editor many years ago, you know, and that's put me in a position of reading a whole range of research and applying uh, discrimination to that research and saying, okay, is this legitimate or not? There is a lot of bad research out there, uh, both in the alternative area and in the conventional area. I mean, a lot of bad research. Uh, I'm not singling out in a, any particular realm. Um, a lot of pharmaceutical research is really skewed, uh, you know, towards showing a beneficial effect and downplaying side effects. And as an integrated practice, you're, you're integrating both traditional as well as complementary and, and alternative. And so where, where needed, you might uh, take a pharmaceutical approach if that's the best first step and, and then 
go to herbology. Talk a little bit about uh, your, your approach with, uh, uh, with different patients. I see it as a spectrum. Um, the sicker the person is, the more I think they need pharmaceuticals, right? If somebody comes to see me and they've got a blood pressure of 180 over 110, uh, I'm not going to fool around with garlic. Right? I'm, I'm, I want to get their blood pressure under control. That's my objective. I don't want somebody stroking out uh, while they wait to see if the garlic or the magnesium uh, or the beetroot juice or any of that stuff has an impact. Uh, I'm still going to give them all the, the dietary recommendations. Um, but, you know, my motto is first treat the symptoms. <laughs> You know, yeah, we want to get to the core. We want to get to the cause. Uh, uh, as the, the naturopaths say, wis medicatrix nature, the heal, let's utilize the healing power of nature. But nature is slow. And the sicker a person is, the longer they waited before they've gotten any care, uh, the more they're going to need a quick fix. So I have nothing against that. You know, if somebody's got pneumonia, uh, I... I'm not going to hesitate to give them an antibiotic if that's what they need. Right? right. But if they've got a little bit of a cough, then I'm not going to jump to the conclusion that they've got bronchitis uh, and they need Zithromax. Right. So that, that's where I think mainstream medicine errs. The, the, there's such a quick jump towards prescribing a pharmaceutical or, you know, antibiotic or something like that. I, I don't go there, you know, if, if somebody's in the early stages of, of uh, osteopenia or maybe even osteoporosis, then I'm going to use uh, supplements and exercise, lifestyle changes. I'm going to try that first before going to a bisphosphonate, right? There's problems with bisphosphonates. So, so again, it's the spectrum and every individual needs something a little bit different. So do a lot of your patients come to you uh, with a particular symptomology? Are, are, they, are they sick or are they coming to you for more of wellness and prevention care? I see a range of, of people. Um, you know, I, unfortunately, I get calls from people all the time that say, well, I, I was diagnosed with advanced cancer and I was told, I've only got a week to live. What can you do? And I say, well, that, that's not what I do, right? I'm, I'm not an oncologist, et cetera. But uh, I do see a lot of people that have been diagnosed with cancer and they have gone through the treatment and then they're told, well, why don't you come back in a year and see if it recurs, right? And so they're, they're kind of left in limbo uh, by their oncologist, you know, they, they say, well, what can I do lifestyle wise? And the oncologist says, well, uh, don't smoke and don't take supplements because supplements are worthless. That's all the advice that they get. And the diet doesn't make any difference. So it doesn't matter what you eat. Um, it's just luck of the draw. You may or may not, you know, get a recurrence. We don't really know. Try to keep your weight down. Why is that? Because, you know, insulin is a growth driver for cancer. So, you know, I certainly think for a lot of cancers, you want to put people on, on very low carb diets or maybe even ketogenic diets. I, I think the data is very clear on that. So again, yeah. I asking the question, well, who, who do I see? Uh, one way I talk about it to my clients is that uh, if, uh, if you need to put together your finances so that you can figure out if you got to pay taxes or not, you see an accountant. If you want to look at your assets and figure out uh, where you're going to be in five years, you see a financial consultant. I'm the medical equivalent of a financial consultant, right? As I help people look at their assets, what's, what do you have that's going for you and what's not going for you? Uh, maybe you inherited some genes that predisposed you to cardiovascular disease, hyperlipidemia, you know, um, hypertension, uh, so you're, you're prone to that because everyone in your family has it. And so that's going to be to your deficit. Um, maybe the beneficial genes that you inherited um, make you more likely to benefit from Reggie's rice, 
right? I, so uh, I'm at risk for cardiovascular disease. I have hyperlipidemia. Uh, am I somebody that really needs to go on a statin? Or could I benefit from red yeast rice or berberine or, or bergamot extract? You know, and again, there's plenty of research on using those kinds of things, but it really depends on the individual. There is reams of data showing that basic supplements, it doesn't have to be anything fancy, A, B, C, D, E, zinc, quercetin, uh, K, as you mentioned. There's reams of data over the years showing that these supplements can prevent viral infections, decrease inflammation, et cetera. So uh, why are we not extrapolating from that? You know, the Chinese are actually doing that. They're, they're using TCM, using herbal medicine. But if you dare to suggest that TCM might be helpful here, um, then you could get in big trouble for doing that. It's, it's almost, it's weird. It's just not logical. With your area of, of specialty in, in herbology, uh, what advice could you give to a practicing physician, perhaps uh, just, you know, getting interested in, uh, you know, anti-aging functional alternative medicine in terms of uh, how to perhaps uh, incorporate um, herbs and herbology into their practice? Yeah. The best advice that I've, I've heard of on this over the years is to start with a handful of herbs and to get to know them well, right? Pick a few herbs that have really good research on them. Like start with curcumin, right? Curcumin's got great research on it. Um, so, you know, pick a few herbs like that. I mentioned milk thistle earlier, uh, another wonderful herb. Start reading the literature on it. Get a sense of, of when it would be uh, appropriate for your patients, you know, and, and find out what companies you trust, you know, get, get connected to companies that use really clean products, you know, they can verify identity. Um, I can't even tell you how important that is. Um, you got to work with a company that's, you know, very careful about what they add, how they do the extracts, what kind of solvents do they use to do the herbal extracts, et cetera. So pick a handful of herbs, try them out, uh, be familiar with the research, you know, know what's evidence-based and work with uh, a, a, some hand-selected companies uh, that you can trust. That's sound advice. And uh, you know what? I think we're going to leave it there for today. Thank you so much for uh, joining us on Redefining Medicine. It's been a pleasure. Mm -hmm.